My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. These lines by the poet Adrian Rich were published eight years after the first Earth Day, April 22, 1970. We've heard this passage often within these walls because it's also known as Reading 463 from our Unitarian Hymn Book. Thanks to Allison, Catherine, and my choir mates for getting us going with music this morning. Good morning to all as we gather to celebrate healing the earth of joining with others to reconstitute the world. I'm Marcia Stevenson, a member of this congregation and your service associate today. Our mission here at North Shore Unitarian is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. Central to that is gathering on Sunday mornings to fire our curiosity, deepen our compassion, and sustain our courage. A special welcome to our visitors and invited guests. Our services vary from week to week, and we suggest you come back a few more times to get a sense of how we do things and what we stand for. But while the format of the services may change, we welcome all to this caring community, no matter who you love, no matter where you find inspiration, and no matter what stage of life you're at. I'd like to invite Barb Kroon to join me to help light our chalice. Barb is a member of the Board of Trustees, and together, we co-chair the Environmental Action Team. Please join in the congregational response with the words you'll see on the screen. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. And now we'll light our candle of global concern. For this earth we live on, this water we drink, this air we breathe, all that nourishes us, forests that give us their healing green, flowers that give us their beauty, <clears throat> fields that give us our daily bread, the wilderness, the urban parks and gardens, all in need of our protection. We remember the ancestors who have lived on this land and who shaped the land today. We acknowledge that we meet on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations, who revere the unity of creation and the cycles that sustain it. We envision the future generations who will live on this land and let their voices fill our hearts. And now Barb will light our candles of joys and concerns. Just a personal note within the congregation, we're aware that today uh, Sonia Macro is celebrating her 100th birthday with her family. We had 100 candles on stage for her last, last week. Any issues which may be lying heavy on your heart this morning, know that you don't have to carry them alone. And on the other side, the candle represents anything positive and helpful. Please rise and body your spirit to join in our first congregational song, Oh, We Give Thanks. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day.
this is an introduction both to uh, a theme for the morning and also to some of the special visitors we have in the congregation today. In my uh, past career as a, a high school teacher, I would often convene this kind of an event where I had many different voices coming up. Um, and you never know what your students or your colleagues are going to say. So there's a little bit of risk this morning, and uh, I'm glad you're all here to share that with me. <laughs> Two years ago this week, during TED Vancouver, just across the inlet, as far as a bird can fly, really, marine biologist Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson gave a talk entitled How to Find Joy in Climate Action. It has since logged almost two million views. Watching her presentation helped me find a pathway out of the overwhelm I sometimes feel with grim climate news. In the Venn diagram you're going to get a close-up next, a close-up next, Dr. Johnson invites us to think about the intersection of what brings us joy, what we're good at, and what work needs doing for the planet. Our guests this morning will tell us some stories of how they've teamed up with others to find their climate action. We'll be hearing from Carla Pellegrini of Food Stash, Michelle Seardown of Regenerate BC, Matt Brown from Swim, Drink, Fish, Judith Brooke from Force of Nature North Shore, and Leanne Payne from Wild Bird Trust. First, we're going to hear the story of one organization that started small with one man working out of the trunk of his car and grew. So I'd like to invite Carla Pellegrini as she makes her way in, up to the stage. Carla Pellegrini is the executive director of Food Stash, a Vancouver-based charity that prevents good food from going to waste and provides dignified food access. Carla has 15 years of experience in community development social finance, and operations management. Before moving to Canada in 2015, she worked abroad with One Acre Fund in Kenya, World Fish in Zambia, and the US Peace Corps in Nicaragua. She holds an MPA from Columbia University and a BA from Boston College. Thanks for that nice introduction, Marcia. And thank you all for having me here. Good morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about food waste and why that has anything to do with climate change this morning. And then I'll talk more about food stash too. So food waste, we waste more than half of the food we produce in Canada. It's about 58% right now. That's the equivalent of 35 million metric tons. It's about 200 million elephants worth of wasted food. And if you put that in emissions standpoint, it's the equivalent of about 12 million cars being on the road for a year. And it's almost a $50 billion cost to the economy. And of all of that wasted food, about a third of it is actually perfectly edible food that could have and should have been eaten. If you put together all of the emissions that go into producing, packaging, transporting our food, and then you factor in all of that food that also gets wasted. When food ends up in the, in the landfill, it generates methane. Food waste would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world, only behind the US and China. It's shocking. And then you layer on to that, that in Canada, one in six households are considered food insecure. They don't have adequate access to the food that they want and need to eat. There's, there's, lots, to, there's lots to say around, around food insecurity, but the most important thing to know is that it's actually a result of poverty. It's not having the financial means to go to the store and buy the food that you and your family want to eat. So when we give people food, we're addressing the immediate hunger that's at play. 
we're not really tackling that underlying poverty that's driving their food insecurity. I'll come back to that in a minute. At Foodstash, we're trying to tackle two of these really massive systemic issues, both food waste and hunger. How we do that, um, we go around Vancouver and we collect surplus food from grocery stores that they're not selling for a wide range of reasons. It's you know, ugly produce that nobody wanted. It's milk that's getting close to the best before date that everyone's too afraid to touch. Uh, it's meat or seafood similarly close to the date, or maybe the store just ordered too much of something and it's not flying off the shelves quick enough. We are collecting about 130,000 pounds of this good surplus food every month. Last year in 2023, it totaled 1.5 million pounds of food. Just us, little, one little organization in Vancouver, collecting from about 30 different stores in Vancouver. And then we do three things with that food. Most of it, about 80% of it, we deliver to 36 other organizations in Vancouver, predominantly in the downtown east side. There are drop-in clinics, housing providers, mental health supports, employment placement services. They're focusing on really massive other issues, but they're trying to meet their clients' basic needs, address their immediate hunger, build community and trust so that they can then work to tackle those issues. Then the remaining 20% of the food that we collect, we bring it back to our warehouse, which is in Mount Pleasant, and we run two programs that, where we serve the community directly. We have a home delivery program for folks with disabilities where physically getting out of the house and accessing healthy, affordable food is challenging for them. There's about 120 households in that program. We customize their boxes of groceries for them. And then we run a, a market that's open to the public that acts as both a low barrier food access program, but also it helps us with our own inventory management to make sure that we're not wasting food at the end of the day either. And then this concept of dignified food access is really important to us. It's not just what we're doing. We're not just moving literally tons and tons of food around to people who need it so it doesn't get wasted. It's how we're doing it. So we prioritize these values of trust and dignity and respect. We believe that regardless of your socioeconomic status, you should be able to choose the food that you want to eat. So we make sure we weave that choice throughout. We're never just dumping food on somebody and saying, I hope you like this. We're saying, what do you like to eat? What can we offer you from, based on what we have? We also never ask for ID. We never do means testing. You don't have to prove you're poor or explain yourself. Just tell us that you need us and we'll be there. And then back to that concept about food insecurity being um, driven by poverty. So this concept of the food bank or even what we're doing at Food Stash, it's, it's temporary food aid. We're addressing someone's immediate need for food, their hunger. But in the long term, if we want to address food insecurity, it's not going to be with food. We've kind of institutionalized this concept of a food bank. We throw tons of government money and our own money at the food bank, and we expect it's going to make food insecurity disappear. But it's not going anywhere. The food bank was set up in the 80s as a temporary solution during a recession. And it's still here today, and it's in more need than ever. And that's because we're not ta tackling poverty with food. We need to tackle poverty with money. Things like universal basic income, living wages, affordable housing, things that put more money in people's pockets so that they can also afford to go to the store and buy food instead of come to a place like Food Stash to get it. And then, so I've, I linked, you know, food waste is a huge driver of climate change, so that inherently our work is trying to support the environment as well as the social side of things. We have this double-sided mission in addition to the fact that we're saving all this food 
from going to waste. We're really conscious about our own environmental impact. So we have new electric refrigeration on one of our trucks. It's solar and battery powered. We're fundraising to get a fully electric truck. Um, we are actually tomorrow on Earth Day, we'll be publishing our first greenhouse gas report, which shows that despite our three trucks on the road seven days a week, we're avoiding more emissions than we're creating through our operations, which is pretty exciting. Um, we also use all reusable equipment in our home delivery program. We try to host zero waste events whenever we can. So trying to be conscious of our own footprint as well. And then just a couple quick tips for you all when you go back home. Food waste at home is, is our homes are a really big source of food waste. So a few things to keep in mind. Um, buy that ugly produce. You know, look, instead of seeking out the perfectly spherical, shiny red apple, look for the one that has a little bruise. Buy that two-legged carrot. <laughs> buy the pepper that has a little nick in it. You're going to chop it up anyway. If we don't buy that ugly produce, it's going to get tossed. And then the dates, I mentioned those a few times. Date labels are a huge reason why so much food is being wasted. And there's a big difference between an expiry date and a best before date. In Canada, only five foods expire. And it's things like baby formula, nutritional supplements, where you really rely on the nutrients. Everything else, milk, meat, seafood, especially non-perishable stuff, all those dates are about freshness. So they're just recommendations you know, by this date, this is optimal freshness. It doesn't mean it's bad after the date. So we encourage people to just pause for a second before you blindly toss something because of the date. Let your senses maybe convince you otherwise. Do this, the taste test and the sniff test. Um, meal planning is another big way to reduce your food waste. Just have a, a vague sense of what your week is looking like, what's reasonable to eat and prepare at home and buy your groceries accordingly so you don't end up with too much. And then get creative, use your freezer, turn things into smoothies and soups when they get wilty and sad, um, and compost. But compost as a last resort. We like to feel good about ourselves for composting, but ideally we should eat that food before we need to compost it. So composting is way better than food scraps ending up in the landfill and generating methane but compost as a last resort. You can also volunteer at Foodstash or one of many other environmentally oriented organizations in the area. And we've got lots of resources on our website. And then I think it's my last slide. As the executive director of a small starving nonprofit, it would be remiss of me to, to not say that we are incredibly dependent on donations and generous folks like you and this congregation has been generously giving to us for the last three years, and we are super grateful. This work costs money, and none of it is coming from the government. So thank you very much for continuing to give generously to support our work. We really appreciate it. I will be downstairs at lunch afterwards. If you have any questions and want to talk to me, there are also some ugly rescued apples down there that I encourage you to eat. Thank you, Carla. I saw the apples when I went downstairs, so that's going to be part of our uh, lunch today. Um, the choir is going to be moving forward in a minute uh, to sing the offertory. And there's a change from the printed program you have. I didn't want to throw out those pieces of paper because there was a couple of changes. So instead of singing what's listed there, uh, Voices of Earth, there's been a change. And instead, we're going to be singing uh, My Heart Soars with lyrics by Chief Dan George. The composer of that piece has interwoven words and melodies from two different spiritual traditions, reminding us of the diversity of expression of our seventh Unitarian principle, honoring the interdependent web of all existence of which we are part. And before we sing, we just want you to know a few things about the offering. 
Each month, we select a charity to receive 100% of our open collection, unless designated otherwise. Donation envelopes can be found on the backs of the chairs where you're sitting. OceanWise, our outreach recipient for April, grew out of the work of the Vancouver Aquarium and now has programs in place to research and address plastic pollution in our oceans, as well as other measures to improve marine habitats and protect sea life. During lunch, you might ask our visitors Dana and John from Positive Voices West Van about the trash collection count from the Ambleside Beach cleanup yesterday. Please give today as generously as you're able, and with the ushers, please come forward as the choir comes up to sing. gifts you bring to this community, we give our most sincere thanks. And now I'd like to invite our second round of speakers to make their way up here to the chairs on the chancel. But Allison and the choir, as they're doing that, are going to be leading us in our next congregational song, What Does the World Require of You? Um, yes, this is one of, I should just tell a tiny story of why I love this so much. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with the service. So, Adara and I got married on the 5th of February, 83, and then from the reception we got on an airplane, 
and came to Canada. Daryl started his job two days later uh, at St. Andrew's Wesley United Church. And uh, my mother, just as we were leaving, said to me, Alison, get your career going before you get pregnant. <laughs> Ten months later, <laughs> Sean was born. And we went from the women's hospital to a workshop that Daryl was helping lead in St. Andrew's West, the United Church. And Sean, our first child, who's now 40, um, fitted in a little doll's cradle. And I walked into the room three days after having had Sean, and of course, oh, and Jim Strathdee was doing this song with the congregation. And there was my firstborn sitting in this tiny little doll's cradle, and I was sitting in a rocking chair watching this workshop, and this is a song that they did. <clears throat> so, um, in, in those days, it was, what does the Lord require of you? We're now doing, what does the world require of you? Which feels just so relevant. So, it starts like this. <clears throat> what does the world require of you? What does the world require of you? So if you have an emotional attachment to that line, just keep singing it. Everybody with me, ready? What does the world require of you? What does the world require of you? You've got it beautifully. The second line goes like this. Justice, kindness, Walk humbly with our world with me. Justice, kindness, walk humbly with our world. Yes, and the last line is to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our world. So, Whichever line most attracts you, just stick with, or with it. Same as with any of these particular projects. If it attracts you and you love it, stick with it. All right, stand up, please. What does the world? What does the world require of you? What does the world require of you? Keep going. What does this kindness walk humbly with our world? To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our world. To seek justice and love kindness. Thanks, Allison. So in addition to our featured speaker, Carla, who had, who had a longer section, I wanted to illustrate that there's a whole variety of ways to find one's climate action. And these people have agreed to give me a shorter version of what they might have said. And they may come back another day to give us more details about what they do. So I've invited them to reflect on a few questions for their elevator pitch to you this morning. Here are the questions. I said, so what factors led you to join the organization you're representing today? What's the focus of your group? And how do your members and staff make a difference for the planet? Now, those are pretty big questions, and uh, we're really keeping them to the time limit, but that's where you all come in because we've invited them to stay for lunch downstairs, and you can find your way to a table and ask them to develop those thoughts a little bit further. So first up will be Michelle Sheardown from Regenerate BC. I'm gonna... Um, let's try it this way. Sure. Do you have books to manage? Do you wanna try it? Okay, that's fine. 
See, we can adapt. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. Uh, that last song was lovely, but the one before, my heart soars, the words of Chief Dan George, they just always, uh, oh, they're just so inspiring. Um, so why did I join the organization? First of all, this organization has a history. We started as Drawdown BC, which came out of the work of uh, Pachamama Alliance and Paul Hawken. Paul Hawkins' first book, uh, the longest title, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to revor reverse global warming, full of solutions about how to actually reduce emissions. So reduce the uh, blanket of poison that we had sent up into our atmosphere. There's a lot of ways to do it. Drawdown BC formed, uh, actually a fellow from Highlands United and the Hug Group there brought it, and then a couple of North Van folks took it over. And then Paul Hawken went on after Drawdown to write another book with an equally long title, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. And we have evolved into that group. I felt like that was necessary to explain. The Pachamama organization, I took several courses with them, and their motto, um, actually there was another slide after this. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, this is uh, our Regenerate BC mission statement, but the Pachamama um, Alliance purpose uh, has an element of spirituality in it that, I've, that resonated with me and it was to provide an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, and socially just human presence on the planet. So that work of um, Pachamama informed me and helped me to find a way into climate action. And as we became Regenerate BC, uh, it's the words of Paul Hawken, and I can't say it any better than him, so I'm just gonna read some of his words. Um, and I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you first what we do. We run courses. We run five session courses in various places across BC. Uh, we're all volunteers. None of us are climate scientists. We are a yeah, volunteer run nonprofit. Um, it's amazing how much we actually get done. We have a very, um, what's it, when it's not a hierarchy, a, a, we work together. Oh, really? Oh my goodness. Okay, I have to get right to it. So I really want to um, say this <clears throat> deeply. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can talk about the frameworks of action later downstairs if anyone wants to hear about it. But regeneration means putting life at the center of every action and decision. So that's equity. That's us, that's life. And it applies to all of creation. Nature and humanity are composed of exquisitely complex networks of relationships without which forests, lands, oceans, countries, and cultures will perish. Vital connections have been severed between human beings and nature, within nature itself, and between people, religions, governments, and commerce. This disconnection is the origin of the climate crisis. It is the very root, and it is where we discover solutions and actions that can engage people. If putting the future of life at the heart of everything we do is not central to our purpose and destiny, why are we here? Thank you. Okay, Matt, would you like to come up here too? Okay. So this is Matt Brown from Swim, Drink, Fish. And in the interest of moving along, I'll just let Matt launch into those questions. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, much like Michelle, uh, I think uh, Chief Dan George's words, uh, they speak to me uh, today in the enthusiasm that uh, this church has to participate. 
Uh, swim, drink, fish. Uh, we are an organization that is focused on water quality. Uh, those three words mean something. Swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. Uh, and we advocate uh, in creating those three things because we believe they're the pillar pillars of a healthy watershed. Uh, in protecting humans, uh, but humans are the voices and the leaders that help us protect an ecosystem that sustains life for all. Uh, and how I ended up with Swim, Drink, Fish uh, is a very personal story to me. Uh, and it started oh, over 10 years ago. Um, on a day like today, I wouldn't have been selling, I was celebrating Earth Day with my wife, Megan, who's here with me today. We would have actually been um, at a hockey arena or at a baseball stadium getting ready for the baseball season and the NHL playoffs. Uh, but I had two pangs in my heart at that time. One was uh, I was falling deeply in love with Megan and there's nothing better in the world than that. And the other one was uh, a feeling of uh, grief. Uh, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but I started to learn that it was something called ecological grief, um, which now has really uh, enhanced in its understanding and what's going on. Um, and at the time I was listening uh, to a podcast with Bill McKibben, who actually told a story that, you know, all of us don't need to be scientists. We don't need to be professionals. We don't need to be experts. We just need to get involved and participate and take action. So I found a local group uh, that was taking volunteers at the time, and it happened to be Swim, Drink, Fish in Toronto. Uh, and we went to our first day of volunteering with Swim, Drink, Fish, uh, which was uh, water quality monitoring, which is the core mechanism of Swim, Drink, Fish's work community-based water monitoring, uh, which is where we train community members to collect water samples and better understand their local watersheds. Uh, at that time, I thought I was very well-versed in understanding uh, water quality. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in Ontario where I was fortunate enough to have pristine waters, but uh, I never, did not understand the impacts of pollution and sewage uh, on water until I got to Toronto and saw millions of people that were alienated from their local waters, something that should have been a right. My wife and I were on the opposite ends of the spectrum. I thought all water was clean. Megan was told, you don't go in there. What we just needed was the education and the action and the participation to understand that we just need to work together to understand that to come to collective solution. And that's what we're doing now at Swim, Drink, Fish, is we are working together with a host of different organizations and communities uh, to better participate in solutions. But what I learned there was that our team can come from all different backgrounds and that for us to come to solutions and to address problems, we just need to start somewhere. Uh, so I've replaced that grief with hope, but hope must be accompanied with action. So that's what I'm asking uh, is all of us to just start somewhere. And that means it could be simply sitting on the shorelines and hearing the waves crash in and feeling that sublime feeling. It could be diving deeper into TED Talks and learning more, and it could be at the level of standing in front of your city council or your politicians and advocating for blue-green roofs and green infrastructure. All it takes is something, though, and we're all going to be part of it, and we'll do it together. Um, so thank you for having me today. Thanks, Matt. And now uh, Judith Brook from Force of Nature North Shore. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your uh, attending today and listening to our discussions of these all great organizations. Um, one of the points that Marcia mentioned was what led me to join Force of Nature. And we saw the Venn diagram and the three overlapping points, what brings you joy, what are you good at, and what work needs doing. I have always been someone who likes to take action to try to make things better. What I am good at is noting an end goal and considering the steps to reach that goal, monitoring and reporting on the journey. I also have grandchildren, nieces and nephews, um, uh, and my great concern <clears throat> for their future. And I want you all to think of what brings you joy and what journey you want to be on to leave a better, healthy world. We all have people, animals, and the planet that we care about. So what is the main focus of Force of Nature? Our alliance is part of a growing grassroots movement to transform Metro Vancouver into Canada's first ever zero-carbon metropolis. 
We're staffed entirely by volunteers. We work together to move the needle on climate efforts at a system level, not just at a personal level. There is a donate button on our blog. Expenses are minimal, uh, such as maintaining an online presence and supporter database. And our blog address is forceofnaturealliance.wordpress.com. So you might be wondering why we focus mostly on municipal work. When it comes to climate solutions, municipalities are key. In 2006, just over 80% of Canada's population was living in urban areas, so it's not surprising that cities are among the, the world's biggest polluters, contributing to an estimated 60 to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. Most of these emissions are within the scope of, of these municipalities to eliminate. That means we can be really effective if we organize where we live. And how do I see our volunteers making a difference? Speaking up on behalf of the climate at a municipal level can be very impactful. Across the North Shore with our three municipalities, Force of Nature has over or approximately 750 supporters. And through our other community action teams, through other municipalities, we have um, several thousand more. Adrian Carr, the current uh, Vancouver City Councillor, has said, quote, I went local because I really believed more could be done at the local level, more actions that cities could take directly and immediately. And if we lead at the local level, it would make a difference provincially and federally. A saying I like to quote is, um, the difficult we do immediately and the impossible just takes a little longer. So don't ever think this is not doable. There are thousands of thousands of examples where what we need doing has already been done. Examples of past volunteer efforts are listed on our blog. A couple of examples, getting gas out of new buildings. We are tracking the quickly growing list of municipalities which have adopted zero carbon step code for new construction of part nine buildings, which are three stories or less, 600 square meters or less. And uh, we've also been participating in Echo Cinema event screening. Please consider signing up today to join our North Shore group online at the blog. Under the volunteer button on the blog, you can choose in which muni you wish to volunteer, Vancouver, Burnaby, North Shore, Tri-Cities, Surrey, or Provincial. We distribute email blasts to share info. Our most recent ones in January, one topic was pedestrian safety meeting, and another topic of an email blast was the District North Van budget feedback. We welcome your input and efforts at any time, and our email ID is northshore at forceofnaturealliance.ca. Thanks for your attention, and I'll be at the luncheon if you'd like to chat further. Thank you. And uh, I can attest that if you get on the list, I'm part of the list for the district, and it comes to me and then I, I know I can think over the issues as they're presented, and then I can um, send off my email to Mayor and Council. So thanks, Force of Nature. And now I'd like to bring up uh, Leanne Payne from Wild Bird Trust that many of us know as Maplewood Flats, but there's a lot more involved. So uh, Leanne. Thank you, Marsha, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Nice to be here with you all. Uh, thank you for those words from Adrian Rich uh, to start us all off. Um, I don't cry a lot, but I was pretty close to it then. And then the words of uh, the late former Chief Dan, uh, Dan George, yes, I sometimes I go Leonard, his son. Um, uh, inspired by the company here, and uh, Carla and I actually have worked in the same co-working space about seven years, six years ago or so. Um, and so it's nice to see her here. I actually heard her on CBC just this last week, so pretty neat how we're all connected here. Um, so I moved out to this lands about 30 years ago and uh, started on the North Shore, did a lot of work on the North Shore with arts, pr predominantly arts organizations, because that's a lot of my background. 
But about 16 years ago, I started working with Erwin Ostindi um, at Gallery Gachet, which is an artist-run centre in the downtown east side. So I've done a lot of work in the downtown east side. Um, and we also then worked in an organization that ran out of the Woodwards complex called W2 Community Media Arts. And we, we also um, initiated a collective called Vancouver Indigenous Media Arts Festival. So I've done a lot of work learning, continuing to learn about my role as a settler to um, do reconciliation and redress work with urban Indigenous and local Indigenous um, initiatives and and learning more about what that means in terms of repairing relations. So not just relations with people, but with place, with birds, wildlife, the land. And um, so the Wild Bird Trust, Maplewood Flats, uh, Irwin invited me to come join him in the work that he was doing with people like Kevin Bell um, and Car Carlene Thomas from Slaywood Nation to change how that organization was working and we now have a majority of Slaywatooth on our board. You can see their faces in our wingspan which there are copies at the back. Um, and uh, repairing relations in that, in that means on all levels of how we operate. So in our governance, in how you know the plant na native plant species that we, we um, foster, we help to come to life in, in our nur plant nursery and on our site, but also doing work around sea level rise, climate action, so doing hosting symposiums, um, habitat restoration, all levels of what we do. Um, and I encourage you to look at Wingspan, it's kind of my speech, uh, you know, you could come to the last day of the canoe culture exhibit that Zoe George, one of Slavitus young um, leaders uh, has created, um, it's going to move to the Maritime Museum so that last day is here. Then we're also going to co-host or host an exhibit that the health department from Slavitut Nation has called Boys Who Wear Their Hair with Braids around their cultural pride with their hair. Um, and then I also wanted to let you know that um, there's some cards where you can sponsor, you can sponsor a, a bird or, or a frog or a deer or a squirrel. Um, so that's another way of, of lending support. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I think that's enough for now. That you, like I said, you can read lots in Wingspan and you can come and speak to me. I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit, um, but then I have to h hurry over to the plant nursery that's open today. So thank you all so much. Uh, nice to see familiar faces too. <laughs> Thanks so much. And some of the plants that are growing in our little pollinator garden actually came from the uh, Salish nursery there. Yeah. So um, thank you all for taking the time uh, to share your thoughts with us today. And uh, for those who can stay, I'm really looking forward to exploring more uh, during lunch. So now we're going to have a bit of a shift. We're going to invite our guests to return to their seats. And Vox Lumen, our choir, will now come up to sing Tending the Spark.
Thanks, choir. And now I'd like to invite the congregation uh, to rise as you're able for the congregational hymn, Blue Boat Home. Anybody in the choir need to grab your music or are you doing okay? You're good? All righty. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all the singers in the room. I'd like to make a few announcements about what's happening today and in the future. So first of all, a reminder to join us downstairs for sandwiches prepared by Diane Hicks. Lively conversation with our guest speakers this morning is also on the menu. Please allow our visitors to move to the front of the food line so that they can take their places at the designated tables, where their names are in little pots of sweet alyssum and other plants. I also understand that board members who wear uh, gray name tags uh, will be available to talk to any newcomers with questions about our congregation. You can look for them at the table with the white cloth in the library corner. Allison and the social justice team would like to thank everyone for their support of the collection drive for food and supplies for North Shore Winter Se Women's Center. And you can check the list in the foyer about that. Next Sunday, April 28th, Susan Forbes will welcome Mary Bennett, a former executive director of the Canadian Unitarian Council, to this pulpit for her presentation on the magic of friendship. Mary has long been interested in how people get connected with one another and within groups. To bring our service to a close, and I'd like to um, give my appreciation to everyone for bringing us in on time. Wow. So in appreciation of everything we've heard this morning and the uh, dedication that it represents both within P 
people in this building and in the larger community. I'm going to leave you with these words by Stuart Kestenbaum. It all comes down to this. In our imperfect world, we are meant to repair and stitch together what beauty there is. Stitch it with compassion and wire. Now I'll ask Barb to come up to extinguish the chalice. Okay. <laughs> Barb, you're already here. You've read my mind. <laughs> Please respond with the words on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of hope. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. And now please rise and join me in singing our final song, Circle Round for Freedom. <laughs>